Good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to everything that you need to know about the Michaela School Judgment in 45 minutes. It's a uh, it's a big claim. Uh, there's a lot in the judgment. I don't know. I think it's around 80, 83 pages long. So we will try our best uh, to cover all of the key areas. Uh, my name is Anna Bikaregi. I am a barrister uh, specialising in education and public law more generally. And Catherine, do you want to introduce yourself briefly? Um, hello, everybody. Um, likewise, I'm a public law specialist at 39. And as part of that, I do a lot of education work. Great. Thank you. So we have got some slides which we'll be able to share afterwards. Um, and uh, let me just get those up. Here we go. Right. So I'm going to hand over to Catherine to start the presentation. Um, so as um, Anna said, there's a lot to get through. Um, so we'll, we'll, we've done our best to cut through the detail to focus on the key points and what you um, really need to know. And um, so I'll begin by looking at the background, some of the facts to the judgment, which you'll appreciate in these sorts of claims do matter. Um, and then I'll look at um, how the Article 9 ground was dealt with, then the index, indirect discrimination ground under the Equality Act. And then I'll hand back to Anna, who's going to talk about the PSED arguments the uh, procedural unfairness arguments to do with the fixed term exclusions, and then both of us at the end will pick up the wider implications. And I should say, um, this goes beyond just the education sphere. So we will be talking about that in terms of religious discrimination um, more broadly. So um, as you'll probably know, this was a challenge to a school policy to ban all prayer rituals. Um, the claimant was um, a practicing Muslim. She'd attended the school called Michaela Community School um, in Brent in London since year seven. So right at the beginning, effectively. Um, and I'll come back to the school uh, in a bit more detail. But key points for now, it was a, it is a secular state school. The headmistress, who you probably know, uh, is quite a controversial character. She's boasted several times that it's the strictest school in Britain. That's all very much deliberate and part of the ethos. And the school gets really exceptionally good results. We were talking yeah. about that earlier. You know, they're not just quite good. It really is for a, comp a genuinely comprehensive school. But well, I think it was the best in the country at one point anyway. The Progress 8, I think. So, yeah, they, they I think... Over, over level two Progress 8 school. Yeah. Um, so the, in terms of background, what happened before this all kicked off? Well, there were some Muslim pupils in the sixth form who um, did pray on the site previously, but it all seemed to be very uncontroversial at that point. It was it sounds like it was pretty small scale and they just they were in the sixth form anyway, so they had more freedom. Um, but that's the sort of the sort of background. But there had been prayer that had happened at the school previously. Um, but it all really kicked off in spring um, 2023. And at this point, the claimant was in year nine. An interest had developed amongst um, several Muslim pupils. I think this coincided with, with Ramadan, pupils who weren't in the sixth form, um, as to the possibility of praying during their lunch break. They all seemed to accept that it wasn't appropriate for them to pray during lesson time or during structured school time. So for example, at the family lunch, uh, in those cases, they were content to rely on what's called kada um, to catch up for their prayers after school. Um, but they thought that it was important to pray during their free time within the school, which was part of the lunch break. Um, and just to say a little bit more about kada, it's, and I should say I know nothing about it other than what's in the judgment, so absolutely not claiming to be an expert. And, and it seems there are various different interpretations and understandings of it. But the claimant's understanding, and the court didn't at any point seek to undermine the legitimacy of this, was that where prayers are unavoidably missed under her understanding of Islam, she could rely on Qadda to catch up. Uh, for those missed prayers um, at another time, so afterwards. So Kada is not available if you just couldn't be bothered to pray or or um, elected not to. But where it's you unavoidably, you know, you can't do it because you have a lesson, for example, you can rely on this principle of Kada. Um, 
at the start of March, a small number of pupils started praying in the playground at lunch break and it quickly escalated. This all happened within really a matter mm. of days, weeks. Um, and by the end of March, there were around 30 pupils praying in the playground during lunch break. And this attracted a lot of attention, as you can imagine, partly because I showed a photograph of the school earlier on, but the playground is visible um, from the street. Yeah, and it's also, it was wet. I think. Yes. So the, the another feature of the school is that I think all of years 9 to 11 have to be in the playground for the break. There isn't yeah. anywhere else for them to go in the school. So there were lots of logistical things I'm sure that Catherine's going to come on to. But yes, it certainly attracted attention. In fact, maybe I'll, yeah, there's a picture of the school, which I will also, well, I'll come on to talking about it, but you can see it. It's an office block. It's not really fit for purpose. Um, it's um, very much been kind of converted into school use. Um, so what, while this was all going, this kind of interest in prayer at lunchtime was escalating, there was evidence that um, part of the reason it was growing was that less devout pupils were being pressurized into praying by more devout um, Muslims at the school and similarly there was some evidence of less devout um, maybe I shouldn't be using the maybe less observant but anyway um, some Muslim pupils being pressured into fasting during Ramadan where they wouldn't otherwise have done um, there was then a problem with rude and defiant behavior displayed by pupils when they were told to put away their prayer map uh, because at that point there was no prohibition on praying, but they weren't allowed to bring in items that weren't expressly permitted by the school and prayer mats was um, a contraband item. And the claimant in particular was apparently extremely rude when challenged by the teacher to put the prayer mat away. Um, and she was given a two day fixed term exclusion for that. Uh, and then four days in the isolation unit subsequently reduced to two days. Anna was going to tell you about that um, shortly. Um, and online, this all got a lot of attention in the press. I'm sure you will have seen at the time, but there was an online petition set up with over 4,000 signatures, um, including some really, really abhorrent abuse directed to school staff um, and the school more generally. Um, the school received a bomb, bomb threat towards the end of March um, on the basis that um, they weren't allowing the pupils to um, pray appropriately. Um, the police searched the school, unfortunately, no, ba no bombs were found. And so in light of this, the um, head teacher, well, officially the governing body, they decided to ban prayer rituals on an interim basis. This was on the 27th of March, and then that became a permanent ban uh, from the 23rd of May. Um, and because of all of this um, concern for safety, because of this bomb scare, um, and the harassment that some staff members were getting. The end of term trips were cancelled. The term ended um, two days early. There was a brick thrown through the window of a teacher's home, an attempted break in at another teacher's home. Um, so it all got really unpleasant. Uh, but then at the start of the summer term, following the interim ban, it seemed that everything um, behaved to normal at the school. There were no further behavioural issues and the threats and harassment eventually died down. Um, a little bit more then about the school, and you'll come to see why this is relevant. The school attributes its amazing results to its ethos, which, is, which essentially has two main components. So first of all, very strict discipline. Um, and the underlying principle is that the authority of staff is absolute. Teachers are not to be questioned. So it's, it's said in, in outright terms, staff and students are not equals. So things like, um, and there are particularly lots of very specific restrictive rules. So the, the school has the rule of four. Children are not allowed to congregate in groups of more than four people. They have to be silent in the corridors. They're not permitted any items on the school property apart from those expressly authorised by the school. So that's why prayer mats, for example, contraband item. Um, if a mobile phone is found on, on the child's person during the school day, it's confiscated for the rest of the half term. The children are actively required to participate in, in class. If they don't all put their hands up to answer a question, even if it's to say they don't know, they are um, given a demerit. 
there is zero tolerance for rule breaking. Uh, and you'll come to see why all of that is relevant. And then the other aspect of the school ethos is this sense of the team. Uh, and really it boils down to sacrificing the individual's preferences for the collective good of the school community. And the way that the school achieves that is by minimizing the distinctions between children as much as possible. So whether that's religious distinctions, um, wealth and class distinctions, race distinctions, whatever it may be, um, the idea is that they're all um, brought, they're all the same, they're all treated the same, there aren't any exceptions. And that is um, thought, the idea of the school is that that promotes social and cultural integration and therefore this environment to do very well academically and produce um, responsible future citizens. As I said, the school's located in a former office building, um, which means that it's very short of space and has some logistical difficulties space-wise. Um, and the other thing to say is that lunch break has two elements. Um, there's a compulsory family lunch, which is when the children eat and they're um, prescribed groups, families that they have to sit in and even given a conversation topic that they have to talk about. And then afterwards, they can uh, participate in educational clubs or what's called supervised socialization. And that's it's this supervised socialization that the claimant um, she understood to be her free time in which she wanted to pray. Um, I just, Anna mentioned something when we were talking earlier about vegetarianism, which mm. was quite an interesting example. I just wondered if you wanted to say anything about that. Yeah, so the school, I think the evidence was in the judgment that after a week um, where they were serving meat in the school canteen, they moved to having an, an entirely vegetarian offer in the school. And that too was because they didn't want there to be distinctions between people who could eat certain meats and people who couldn't. So they just simply implemented vegetarianism across the board and again so there really was and it does become very important uh, and this is why this case I think is is interesting um, the evidence was very strong that this ethos really did pervade the school and that uh, it was very much in place as I say within a week of the school opening it wasn't something that had just been sort of retrofitted yeah absolutely so um, that's the background coming on then to article nine um, and how that was dealt with. Well, the court dismissed the Article 9 ground on two bases. First of all, it was found there was no interference with the claimant's Article 9 rights. And that, I think, is quite counterintuitive and interesting. Mm -hmm. we're, go we're going to talk about that in some more detail. Um, and in any event, if there was interference, that was justified. So I'm going to look at those um, two points in turn. Why was there no interference? Well, the court relied on um, case law um, from Strasbourg, but then sort of assimilated by the domestic courts, um, which, which said that whether there is interference will depend on all the circumstances, including the extent to which the circumstances of an individual can reasonably be expect to be at liberty to manifest his belief in practice. Um, so that's the Williamson case. And then in Begum, uh, Lord Bingham said this, the, and he's, so he reviewed the um, Strasbourg authorities and said, the Strasbourg institutions have not been at all ready to find an interference with the right to manifest religious belief in practice or observance where a person has voluntarily accepted an employment or role which does not accommodate that practice or observance, and there are other means open to the person to practice or observe his or her religion without undue hardship or convenience. Um, so to sort of take a step back and paraphrase then, what do you need for there to be an interference? Well, or for there not to be an interference? Voluntary acceptance, of a particular set of circumstances is one aspect, but then also um, whether it's possible to um, continue to um, observe or practice your religious belief without undue hardship or inconvenience. So in other words, if a person can avoid the interference arising, there won't be an interference in the first place. So how did that apply here? Well, the court found that that test to be satisfied um, so that there was no interference. Um, 
it was it was said that the the, the girl had volunt had impliedly accepted restrictions on her freedom of religion when she enrolled at the particular school. And that was because the school was known to be secular and very strict. Indeed, her mother liked the school because it was so strict. Um, and the claimant tried to argue that actually there couldn't be voluntary acceptance because at the time she joined the school, there weren't any prohibitions on prayer rituals. Uh, but the court said, no, no, it doesn't matter that she wasn't aware of the precise nature of the restrictions. By going to that school with its particular ethos, um, she she knew in broad terms that her freedom of religion was going to be restricted. I think she I think the claimant's own evidence was that she thought that it was not acceptable. But I think there was some other sort of but yes, actually yeah. she was yeah. So there was a sort of slight contradiction between the the way that it was put legally and the, the claimant's evidence, I think, which meant that it wasn't accepted. Yeah, I think that yeah, I think that's right. Um, so that's the first aspect. Um, but and then the court also went on to find to find that on these facts, it would have been possible for the claimant to observe her religion without undue hardship or inconvenience, which in practice meant she could go to another school where she was allowed to pray uh, without undue hardship or convenience. Um, and I think this is the part that Anna and I, um, I think it's fair to say we struggle with. It's it's quite problematic. Um, so. Um, effectively, what the court said was that she hasn't produced any evidence to show that she can't go to another school. Um, so you can see from the quote that I've put, um, she's not adduced any specific evidence about other schools in the area to show, for example, that in fact there is no school within travelling distance which would permit her to do so, i.e. to pray, or there is no such suitable school, or that it would be impossible for her to secure a place at such a school. So you can see it's really quite a high threshold that it's imposing. Um, and then he, he rejected the arguments that she put forward, as he said, based on her preferences. So in particular, she'd said, well, you know, I was in year nine when this all happened, I was about to start my GCSEs, or, you know, I don't critical time I wouldn't want to move school at that point because of the implications for my academic performance um, and and also the fact that this school um, did so well academically that realistically at another school she probably would have done less well um, and the judge said I do not suggest he, he recognized that those were adverse consequences I do not suggest that there would be no adverse consequences for the claimant if she were to choose to move but it is reasonable to assume that in all of the article 9 schools cases the parents and the pupil had a preference for the school about which they were complaining and the pupil had no wish to move which of course on one level is correct I mean that's why the situation has arisen yeah. in the first place um but We'll come on to talk about this in a bit more detail. In a practical sense, that means it's very difficult to envisage a situation in a school context where there will be an interference with Article 9. And of course, that's the first stage. So it's do not pass go, do not collect £200. If you can't even show an interference, I mean, it, it's, it's hopeless. Um, so anyway, we'll come on to that. I put in brackets a final um, aspect that was relied on here. And I, the reason I put it in brackets was that the court made it very clear that this was an additional reason. So he would have found no interference just based on what I've already said. But he also said, uh, well, the prohibition on lunchtime, um, lunchtime prayers means that she could have used CADA under her own understanding of that concept to catch up because if they would have been unavoidably missed because of the, the ban. Um, so that's more specific to this particular case, but as I said, not relied on in any, in, in any event. Um, so that's part one. That's why there was no interference. Why then was the interference justified? Um, and there were various factors, but what I've tried to do is to take the key elements. Um, the first factor that the judge relied on was this um, risk of peer pressure or intimidation of less observant Muslim pupils and there was evidence um, and the judge saw no reason to, to question that that um, that had been the effect previously of, of um, pupils praying at the school and so wanting to avoid that um, impact and um, to protect those children was an aspect of, um, of an, a legitimate aim. Um, more broadly um, 
the the judge relied on um the school's um objective um its ethos to protect well to to generate inclusivity and social cohesion um and given the evidence again this was questioned by the claimant but the, the court didn't bite given the evidence that the take up of these prayers would have been substantial mm. um there was a real risk as the judge saw it that the school's um approach to inclusivity and social cohesion would be undermined um, and it's important to be clear about what that approach involved, uh, because it's a particular um, a particular method that many people would not agree with. And I think it's fair to say that it did focus on eliminating difference between yeah. students. So if you like, it's very much the, the secular route to achieving social um, cohesion, as opposed to the I'll put it bluntly, the multicultural route yeah. where you're actually sort of celebrating difference between people and teaching them to be respectful of that difference, which is a route to the same objective. Um, but interestingly, the judge uh, and the claimant criticised that and said eliminating difference is actually um, means that it's impossible to achieve social cohesion in reality, you know, pretending that there aren't these differences between people. But the judge said, it's not for me to take a view about that. The point is the school, social cohesion is the objective that we all want. The school has chosen their chosen method for um, trying to achieve that. And that is a legitimate aim. And it is not for me to go behind that. And as a matter of fact, on the evidence, um, and this I think absolutely has to be true, having Muslim students um, withdrawing from the school socialization time, even for five minutes, particularly given the quantities involved, would serve to um, emphasise their religious difference um, and serve to stress the, the differences between those students and other students. Um, there was also reliance on the complexity of the practical mm -hmm. arrangement that would be required given the lack of suitable space and staff supervision. Again, I think quite specific to that yeah. particular school, given the yeah. genuine difficulties that they had with their building it would have to be they'd have to open up classrooms that would otherwise be locked because the children's possessions were in them and they would have to be supervised so it was a yeah again very particular to the facts of this case I think. yeah exactly um, and then he also relied again on the availability of, of CADA as a way for the um, student to um, adhere to her religion while also respecting the this prohibition that the school had imposed and the fact that it was her choice to attend that particular school. Um, interestingly, I'll just mention here, um, he did he very expressly did not rely on the risk of the bomb scares being repeated mm. and the harassment. Um, and I think rightly so, because he recognised that that if, if prayers were actively permitted by the school, then the risk of those things occurring again was much reduced. Um, so, um, I, I, and I think that means that a, more of this reasoning would be applicable to other contexts, because how often is there going to be a bomb scare, hopefully? <laughs> One would hope not very often, but actually it wasn't relied on anyway in him finding the interference yep. to be justified. So, um, oh, that's an interesting question. I was just thinking that... Yeah, so someone, or should we do with yeah. it now? Someone's asking, did the school permit wearing hijabs, crosses, etc.? Um, uh, uh, yes, it did. So, but within very strict parameters. So, um, headscarves for girls, um, they were very strictly prescribed by the uniform. Um, I think no face coverings, but they were allowed to and wear like headscarves of a yeah. particular type. Um, and similarly for, I, I don't know, crosses weren't particularly mentioned, but um, I, I don't know the band. name of them, but the red band worn by some Hindus, that was permitted. Um, I think certain um, symbols worn by Sikhs as well. Um, so, and, and actually the judge relied on that to say that um, the school wasn't just completely eliminating difference. It was the fact that this particular practice had this impact of um, sowing division as the school saw it and emphasizing difference in a way that these other was, symbols yeah. didn't because they were quite, um, well, I was going to say unobtrusive. I'm not sure I really agree with that because it is very visually prominent, isn't it? But anyway, the, it, yeah. the school didn't feel that it um, affected its objectives to the same extent. Um, I'm, I think maybe we should come yeah. back to some maybe of these should, questions. Yeah. Um, just to finish off, 
briefly then before I hand over to Anna. So the second part of this um, case was the indirect discrimination argument under the Equality Act, um, which, as I'm sure you'll all know, relied on the provisions in Section 85. The responsible body, so i.e. the governing body of a school, must not discriminate against a pupil for various things. And then there's a sort of catch all at the end by subjecting the pupil um, to any other detriment. And so that was what was relied on here. The claimant argued that the prohibition amounted to indirect discrimination on the basis of religion. And that was because Muslim pupils were disproportionately affected because um, in reality, they were the ones whose religion required them to have this um, prayer ritual, whereas other really a Christian people, for example, could just you know, pray discreetly in their head without having to perform the, the ritual. Um, and here the, the judge found that the claimant was subjected to a detriment for the purposes of Section 85.2. And he stressed that that's a different test than the interference test, effectively a lower threshold. Um, but then he said that the prohibition was justified for the same reasons given as the Article 14 justification. So again, we're going to come back to that as to what that means for future claims and how they need to be formulated. Um, so I will at that point hand over to Anna. Great. So I am looking at the time and I'll promise to cover this in 45 minutes. So um, I, I will... I will see what I can do on the public sector equality duty. So um, I've, I've put it up on screen just as a reminder of what it involves. Uh, so it was obviously accepted that it applied to the school and that it meant that uh, the school in this case must, when exercising, exercising its functions, and for these purposes, it was essentially the governing body's decision to implement the policy, the ritual, uh, ritual prayer policy in May, it must have due regard to the need to eliminate discrimination, harassment, victimization, and in any other conduct that's prohibited under the Equality Act, to advance equality of opportunity between persons who share a relevant protected characteristic and persons who do not share it. I should say in this case, the ritual prayer ban did apply across the board, but as everyone accepted, it obviously had a disproportionate effect on the, the Muslim pupils. And lastly, to foster good relations between persons who share a relevant protected characteristics and persons who do not share it. Um, now, there were um, for people who practice judicial review in this particular area, there are some very useful parts of this judgment in terms of the public sector equality duty because the claimant sets out what they saw as the key principles, and those are reflected in what's on screen. Uh, and these slides will be available afterwards. And that was essentially the principles in the Bridges case. Um, I'm not going to go through them all one by one, uh, but those were the principles that the, the claimant thought were important to draw attention to. Uh, we also have, I'm going to come back to this slide, the points that the defendant emphasized as being important to the public sector equality duty. And again, when you're advocating for one side or the other, I think it's obviously interesting to see which cases are relied on, which parts of the cases are relied on. Again, I don't think in the time we can go through all of this in detail. Um, but for example, um, it, some of these are important in terms of the decision that were actually made. So number one here, the, the duty is, an is a procedural requirement rather than requiring a particular outcome, um, although obviously that doesn't diminish its importance. And whether or not there's been due regard, this is point four, is a matter of substance, not a matter of form. So it's not a question of sitting down and saying, and now I'm going to consider the requirements of section 149. It's whether or not genuinely they have engaged with it in practice and, and come up with the, their reasons. So going back to uh, this slide, um, the, there were some interesting points about the requirement to monitor as well. Um, so there's no specific or sort of separate requirement to monitor, but what it all depends on what due regard means in the fact of any particular case. So it depends on the context, it depends on the evidence. Um, it's, it's part of the duty, but, but you have to see it within the particular factual context. The conclusion on monitoring in this case comes in paragraph 266. Uh, and that was that it just simply didn't arise on the facts of this case, because the pleaded case was all about whether or not uh, due regard was given at the point when the policy was implemented. 
uh, and it hadn't been pleaded that actually since the policy was implemented there hadn't been a monitoring in terms of the public sector equality duty that wasn't pleaded um i should say as well just while i'm talking fast <laughs> um, that um again for practitioners of judicial review there are some really interesting um parts of this judgment which are about pleading what you need to do in judicial review. Uh, it was suggested by the defendant, for example, that the claimant hadn't pleaded matters which were in the skeleton argument in relation to this particular ground. Um, and the judge very forensically goes through and looks at what was pleaded. So again, just for practitioners of judicial review, um, I'm simply not time to go through that. And it's obviously incredibly fact specific, but it is worth um, looking at if anything is coming up uh, or you're thinking about what you need to plead. So what does that mean then in terms of what was decided? Um, so just again, a few matters. The judge accepted as relevant that the governing body was likely to have a degree of familiarity with the school by virtue of its role. In other words, they weren't just coming to this case without any sort of the contextual knowledge. They knew about the buildings. They knew about the restraints. They knew about the team ethos. They knew about family lunch. And absent evidence to the contrary, therefore, it would be taken that they carefully considered the information. And the judge also accepted the head teacher's evidence that it was entirely obvious, this is a quote, to everyone at the school and on the governing body that the policy on um, is it religious practice? Prohibition no. on prayer ritual, I think. Oh, it's um, yeah. it's the policy on ritual prayer. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which have more of an impact on Muslim children and children from certain ethnic backgrounds than on other children, although it could also have an adverse impacts on children of other religions. And what that was going to was, again, the extent to which all of this needs to be set out. So uh, it was clear, it was said that to the governing body and to the head teacher that this would have had a disproportionate yeah. impact on... Substance on... over form. Exactly, basically. exactly. Uh, this wasn't a case where there were potential hidden impacts of the relevant measure. Um, and then in paragraph 260, the judge carefully goes through all of the different aspects of the public sector quality duty and finds that the governing body had due regard to them. He does find, of course, as part of the duty, that there's a duty of reasonable inquiry. But, and I think this is interesting more broadly, that governors are um, entitled to rely on the inquiries that had been made by the head teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have to seek out independent um, information on their own. They can rely on what the head teacher tells them. Um, and yes, the, you don't need, to, as I said, I've said this already, you don't need to sort of say, I'm now about to consider section 149. Uh, he also, and this is again interesting for people who do judicial review more broadly, uh, he also said that he would have refused relief under section 31-2A of the Senior Courts Act 1981. And again on that, there's some very useful principles set out about the situations in which uh, that would apply. I think it's probably not worth going through that in detail um, at the moment, given that we're focusing on the judgment. Um, but essentially, it's that it would be highly likely that the outcome would have been the same for the claimant, whether or not the prohibited conduct had happened. I, I'm going to touch on this briefly. So this is in the slide pack that you will get, but it's actually something that Catherine has mentioned um, previously. So um, and it's, I think it is one of the more in more interesting parts of the judgment generally. Um, and that's this notion that. Um, the, uh, it says here the head teacher's view was that the prohibition on ritual prayer or the policy on ritual prayer would would promote a secular inclusive environment um, and would eliminate uh, would stop division into groups defined by reference to to religion. The governing body was asked to consider her view that it would promote the ethos of the school to and um, quote this is a quote to build friendships across the faiths and not to allow segregation. Um, so. That's, um, as mm -hmm. Catherine has said, that's a very, that's a singular view, if you like, of the way that you can promote this. It's a kind of French view of mm -hmm. secularism. Um, and the judge accepted that evidence. He said in another paragraph of the judgment, I appreciate that views may differ as to whether this policy would be likely to promote these objectives. But section 149 requires due regard to the statutory objectives rather than the decision maker accepting an approach um, or or taking an approach with which the court or others would agree. In other words, it's not for us mm. or the court, really, as long as the uh, in, in terms of Section 149, due regard has been given to those in a clearly in a way that has to be sincere. Yeah. And um, but that, I think that is an interesting part 
of the judgment. Just lastly, and this is just going to come with the slides, I took, uh, took the view that a number of people watching this webinar might be practicing in education. So I've put a number of um, cases where the public sector equality duty has been looked at recently in education cases. Um, but I, I'm not going to go into that. So I, I, I think we need to leave some time for questions. Mm -hmm. So, right, quickly on the exclusions point, um, there were two fixed term exclusions in this case, um, as Catherine mentioned at the beginning, and two quite different fixed term exclusions. And that really is sort of the nub of why the judge in this case found that there wasn't a breach in relation to the first fixed term exclusion, but there was in relation to the second. So again, the slides will go through um, a little bit of detail um, about the policies, etc. But if I just give you a kind of overview of, of what was found in this case. Um, and first of all, I need to say something about the first fixed term exclusion. That was the exclusion where the claimant was said to have been very rude and defiant mm. to teacher A. Um, and the evidence in relation to that was direct evidence from teacher A. At the beginning of all of this, Catherine told you um, that the school is very, very clear that the teachers and the pupils are not, they're not equal. And therefore, the evidence of teacher A that she had been spoken to in this particular way was very compelling for the head teacher. In the second incident, um, and in this case, the sanction was greater, it was for five days, there wasn't evidence from a teacher, there was evidence from a number of pupils. Um, and that's the context against which um, it's important to um, look at what was found in this case. So the judge, uh, it was all about whether or not the views of the pupils should always be taken into account. Uh, the defendant school sought to argue that the guidance meant that you only had to take them into account in cases of permanent exclusion. And the judge said that he, he rejected that. Um, and that the, the real question is here, it's this middle bullet point. Um, the, the school's own exclusion policy, quite apart from the guidance, was intended to provide that the head teacher would give the pupil or their parent or carer an opportunity to respond to an allegation against them by evidence, comment or argument. And this is the crucial bit, unless it was not appropriate to do so. So the nub of it was, so in, in neither case um, were, were the claimant, were the pupil's views um, asked for or taken into account. The difference being that it was not appropriate to do so on the head teacher's account in the first case because there was evidence, direct evidence from a teacher that she had been spoken to in a particular way. Um, this, in the second case, it would have been appropriate to do so because it was not the case that it was the evidence of a teacher. It was a, the evidence of lots of disparate pupils, uh, some of it dating from well before the incident in question. Um, and uh, again, the head teacher's own evidence, um, and this was before the court, when she had spoken to the claimant's mother, um, was that they didn't need to do it when it was the evidence of a teacher against the pupil, but where it was the evidence of two pupils, they should do it. So very different factually, but the court found, therefore, that the second um, uh, fixed term exclusion, sorry, and the failure to take account of or sort of glean the claimant's evidence in any way was a breach. I think technically it's a procedural breach, but obviously it's, I think it goes a bit beyond that because the judge finds that even if that it, it, there was no guarantee that the decision would have been the same if they had taken all these into account. So it's a, it's a fairly substantive, substantive breach, I think, of the, the guidance in those terms. Well, and I think will actually affect how the school manages this in future. Absolutely. Uh, even if it, you know, would end up making the same decision, it's going to have to go through the motions at least. Exactly. Yeah. And actually, the evidence on that is fairly, it, it, the, the way that it was summarised, when you look at the claimant's evidence, it, it doesn't seem to bear it out in, in any particular way. So that... I'm conscious that I'm rushing. I'm rushing because we said that we'd finished by one to past one. So um, it's very interesting. Um, there's lots of good stuff in there for people who um, do exclusions in schools about the guidance, about how poorly drafted the school's own guidance is. There's lots of mm. information in there, but I think we're going to move on to um, wider implications. I've put at the top the victory for all schools question mark. Yeah. Um, and uh, so Catherine's touched on some of this and um, but basically, the question being, I think the head teacher said in a press release that that this was essentially a victory for schools. I think what we've said so far indicates that um, a lot of this is going to turn much more closely on the facts. But I think you, your your point, I think, was the Article Nine point. So 
Yeah, so I think from a sort of, I'm looking at all the questions and we will try and answer a, a couple of them, but I think, you know, we're lawyers and we're, we're going to, I think, focus more on the kind of geeky legal stuff because that's our, that's our job. Um, but I think what is really significant about this and of wider implication and wider application is the very restrictive approach that the court took to finding whether there was an interference with the claimant's yeah. Article 9 rights. Um, such that we talked about this and we think it's difficult in practice to conceive of any realistic situation where there's going to be an interference, not even a breach. We haven't got to that stage, an interference yeah. with a child's Article 9 right or a young person's Article 9 rights by an educational institution. And that's because in the vast, vast majority of cases, there will be nothing to actually prevent the claimant moving to another institution where they can, um, well, it depends on what the case is about, but where they can pray or wear a headscarf or whatever it may be, um, particularly given that in this country we have state faith schools. Um, and so, um, as I see it, that deprives Article 9 of really having any meaningful application in this context, which is really um, significant. And from my point of view, I think very problematic. Um, I personally think that these are factors that should be taken into account as part of the justification question. You know, it's a much wider weighing of the different yeah. elements. But to just say that there's no interference at all and dismiss it at that point, I think, really deprives that right of any meaningful application and, and therefore protection. And that yeah. makes me think we don't know if it's being appealed yet. <laughs> mm. So um, it's only recently published, as everybody knows, but it's entirely possible that... There will be an that there will be an appeal. Although that said, I mean, it's not like the judge just went off on a total no. tangent. I mean, this, this the approach that he applied is founded in the authorities. I think it's probably more on the facts that he that he found that you know things like the disruption with her GCSEs and to her social group, yeah. and you know the fact that he dismissed all of those factors and said, oh, she could just move school. That is probably where an, an appeal might get some yeah. traction but the sort of principle that where a person can avoid the impact there won't be an interference is now pretty well established and I think it was conceded wasn't it that Begum applied yeah so um which then that's where that lies um but so just very quickly then so I think basically to be really crude about it out with article 9 not going to help very much in this context but the Equality Act is not dead yet um, detriment is a lower threshold. The courts were satisfied that there was detriment. So in future, these sorts of claims are going to have to be brought as indirect discrimination under the Equality Act. Um, so the question will then be whether the restriction is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. And that will depend on the facts. I do not think it is correct to um, extrapolate from this judgment that these restrictions will always be justified because it's really fact specific as this judgment makes abundantly clear and here this school was exceptional by any standards I hope we've communicated that clearly through this session but they had this really unusual and incredibly clear policy this sort of I think it's fair to say aggressive form of secularism yeah, I think the teacher said the head teacher said that yeah yeah aggressive integration yeah um and, and most schools do not have that and as well and someone's asked a question about this there was actual evidence of this intimidation of less observant muslim pupils and also this this wider context of this appalling um harassment um that the school mm. suffered as a result of this so all of that mix is very very unusual um so 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 be, so these claims are not dead but they need to be brought in a different way under the Equality Act, um, and it will very much depend on, on the facts as to whether they're um, justified. Schools can, uh, there's nothing wrong with this kind of secular approach, if that's what the school wants to, to um, pursue in theory. Equally, there's nothing wrong with the multiculturalism approach. The court made it very clear it's not for the court to intervene, that's the decision maker. So I suppose in that sense, it is a victory for schools. If they're sensible yeah. about it, they can develop their own kind of ethos. Yeah, I think on the next slide, um, some of that... Um, oh, sorry. No, no, yeah, no, no, no. It's just that it made me think when you said that. So um, although um, the judge rejected the claimant's submission that high quality decision making was needed to make out a justification defence, because it was a matter for the court, essentially, um, 
the judge did say all other things being equal, the better the quality of the decision making process and the greater the relative level of expertise of the decision maker, the greater the weight which their judgment is likely to be given by the court. So you're right. And that isn't obviously limited to the particular form of integration and secularism. That is absolutely yeah. a matter for the decision maker. So um, I think there is some. Yeah, it's it's a. It's an unusual case on the facts, as Catherine says. It, there's not only the ethos, but there is the sheerly, the, just the practical um, constraints of that particular building, which yeah. sounds mad, but actually that weighs heavily in the judgment. So, you know, everything's still to play for. I think you're right in terms of the Equality Act um, case, and also in terms of the the public sector equality yeah. duty, because that's all about substance as well, and the extent to which yeah. genuinely the decision maker can show that they've taken those very important factors uh, into account. And I do think with the PSED, because it sort of reached a high point a few years mm. ago, and now the courts seem to hate the PSED, but these monitoring type arguments seem to be the some asylum support cases recently, for example, that found breaches based yeah. on a failure to monitor. So I have a theory that that might be the next sort of wave of cases. But here it just, well, it wasn't pleaded from the outset. And, and also, I don't, to me, it doesn't really sound like a monitoring case anyway. No. It's not that sort of scenario. But anyway, scope for using it in future. Yeah. And I think just the a final thing to say about other contexts, this point about there being no interference with Article 9, we don't know really the extent to which it applies to other contexts. We, we do in employment because yeah. that's where a lot of the case law already is from which these, um, AUDA, for example, in Strasbourg, if I'm pronouncing that right, was an employment case. But for example, in the services context, um, we just don't really know at, at this point how it applies um, and how, um, yeah, the extent to which you can extrapolate. It's all very uncertain. You know, if someone can choose to get their books from another library, for example, that does allow mm -hmm. them to pray. I don't know why I've chosen that example, but to pray in a library, does that mean that there's no um, no interference? Very possibly. Yeah. Um, we don't know. Just having a look, there are lots of questions. Yes, the recording will be made available and the slides. Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, there's just good videos. I'm just trying to spot if there are any that are sort of, sort of straightforwardly legal that we can mop up. But I think, I mean, lots of these are absolutely questions that arise, but a lot of them are sort of factual questions. Yeah, I think um, I'm. I'm sorry. <laughs> so much to get through. Um, um, where we've tried time. to focus on the yeah. key points, and we will. We might try. Uh, we can have a look through, and if there are any that we can um, answer, we can um, we can try and do that by email. If there's anything that arises, but otherwise, the recording will be available, and the slides will be available. And thank you very much for joining this slightly longer. I think it's looks like it's 49 minutes on. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.